So we are going to carry on, uh, like I say, our study in Mark's Gospel. And we've been going through it. If this is your first week with us, if you're new with us, what we've been doing is we've been going through Mark's gospel week by week. And we take like a section of the gospel and we just look at that section. And then next week we look at the next section and so on and so forth. Uh, And we've been doing that. And the last few weeks have been absolutely fascinating because the stories have taken this sort of real interesting twist where uh, two weeks ago we talked about how Jesus deals with prejudice and what he what you know his response to prejudice um and last week sharon talked about um how jesus deals with sexism and she was great wasn't she sharon love that uh love that word that she bought absolutely fantastic uh, and just sort of jesus is challenging everybody's atti- uh, everybody's attitudes towards women at the time which was amazing and so uh, Mark's kind of taken this interesting turn and we're going to carry on a little bit in that vein, it seems, with this week's story, because Jesus um, is is sort of challenging a few preconceptions. But there's there's so much in this story. I've been kind of chewing on this all week, let me tell you. And um, the hardest thing is figuring what to leave out when you prep these talks. Um, let me tell you, it's just insane. Uh, but... We are going to get into it. So that's sort of the background. We're in Mark's gospel. Jesus has challenged people's perceptions about different people groups. He's challenged people's perceptions about women. And we are going to pick up the story in Mark's gospel at chapter 7. So let's bring up the Bible verses here. So it says this, after this, after uh, after Sharon's talk, that's what it means, uh, after Sharon's talk, Jesus left the coastline uh, of Tyre and came through Sidon and on his way to, uh, sorry, came to Sidon on his way to Lake Galilee over into the regions of Syria. Now, some people brought to him a deaf man with a severe speech impediment. Uh, they pleaded with Jesus to place his hands on him and heal him. Now, let me. There we go. Uh, So Jesus led him away from the crowd to a private spot. Then he stuck his fingers into the man's ears uh, and placed some saliva on the man's tongue. How did he do that? Uh, Then he gazed into heaven, sighed deeply and spoke to the man's ears and tongue. uh, Ethpathaka. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but that's that's a good go. All say that with me. Ethpathaka, which is Aramaic for open up now. And so um, at once the man's ears opened and he could hear perfectly and his tongue was untied and he began to speak normally, which is amazing, right? And Jesus ordered everyone to keep this miracle a secret, but the more he told them not to, the more the news spread. Uh, The people were absolutely beside themselves and astonished beyond measure and they began to declare everything he does is wonderful. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak okay oh some great verses there isn't there and so there's three three specific groups or three specific people uh, that I want to look at uh, in this story if I can and the first group uh, is this group here some people Um, so there's a crowd of people and out of this crowd some people emerge and they bring to Jesus uh, the deaf man with a severe speech impediment which is the second person I want to look at Um, and the third person I want to look at of course is Jesus because as we all know every good story is centered around Jesus and this one is no exception so let's deal with some people let's look at who these people are so when I read um, stories like this um, and I read just these little phrases like some people the first question in my head is well who are those and why uh, why is the bible sort of bringing our attention to some people okay so we read uh, here in the verse that Jesus is in a place called Sidon Uh, And Sidon, just so you know, was a bit of a bustling city at this point. It was a thriving town, lots of trade. It's in modern day Lebanon and it's up on the coast north of Israel. Um, And actually Sidon is mentioned quite a lot in the Old Testament. And not in a good way, if I'm honest with you. Um, There's a lot of Old Testament prophecies sort of rallying against uh, Sidon, prophesying its destruction and its, you know, the fact it's going to get conquered, which happens numerous times, right? Every single one of the Old Testament prophecies comes true. Uh, another bit of an interesting fact for you, Sidon gets his name 
Does anybody know from where? From Noah's great-grandson, for those of you who like Bible trivia. Uh, So Noah's great-grandson was called Sidon, and this is where the name came from. So at the time of Jesus, it had been conquered and destroyed many times, but under Roman rule, it was again a thriving city, a port city, but it was a pagan city, and throughout the Old Testament and in the time of Jesus, people from Sidon oppressed Israel. There's this big sort of tradition and history of oppression, right? Um, And yet Jesus goes there to sort of minister, and this is... This is carrying on this theme, isn't it, of uh, of dealing with sexism and prejudice. The last the last two weeks we've been talking about, because here's another people group that have historically persecuted Israel and the Jewish people. They don't worship the same God. They're you know they've got all kinds of issues going on, and yet Jesus goes there to preach the gospel again, tearing down these walls and these barriers of segregation um, in people's minds. Do you know what I mean? And just going to these places that everybody at the time, all the religious people at the time, thought you just should not go, and Jesus goes there uh, and shows us a great sort of attitude. And in the scripture it says here, when he gets there, some people brought to him a deaf man. Now, some people. So it is reasonable to assume um, that some people were probably uh, Sidonians uh, or Sidonians. Sidonians? Sidonians? People from Sidon or Sidon. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right. It's getting all wrong today, isn't it? <laughs> um, and so they were from Sidon. Uh, so there were Sidonians. It's reasonable to assume that. And actually, if you head back a few chapters in Mark's gospel, you know that these people would have um, more than likely seen and encountered Jesus already. It's not the first encounter Jesus has with them. And it's not the first time that he sort of does a miracle amongst these sorts of, you know, amongst these guys, amongst these people. And the interesting thing to notice about them, not only were Sidonians not religious, um, but they they weren't really, in the eyes of the church or the the religious institutions at the time, they weren't really clever people. Um, they weren't smart people. They were just regular people, right? Ordinary people, people not particularly liked by the religious folks. They didn't have any special skills or abilities, it seems. They weren't leaders. They weren't kings. They were just ordinary people. So some people were ordinary people, just like you, just like me. And they make this amazing difference to this guy's life, right? Because they bring to Jesus this man with a severe speech impediment. Okay, and here's the thing. Here's a question for you. What would have happened had they not have brought this guy to Jesus? Um, The guy with a severe speech impediment who was deaf. I kind of wonder if he had died a deaf guy with a severe speech impediment because some people didn't intervene and didn't bring him to Jesus. And I wonder if sometimes the thing that stops Jesus doing things in people's lives is fundamentally because some people haven't intervened. Um, normal folks, everyday folks, people like you and me who have encountered Jesus before, we we haven't intervened and, and brought somebody to Jesus. Does that make sense? So these guys, they bring uh, the deaf man with a speech impediment to Jesus, and it says here, they pleaded with Jesus to place his hands on him and heal people. So if I look at this and go, well, What's the challenge for me here? Is the challenge actually that there are people around me who are so hurt, that are so broken, that are so ill, that they don't know to actually go to Jesus for themselves, right? They need somebody to take them, somebody to guide them, somebody to show them, somebody to help them, somebody to intervene. And so if that's me, if I if I take that as a challenge to myself, who do I need to bring to Jesus? Who around me is hurting that I need to bring I then kind of get down the question of, well, well, how do I do that? Because obviously, you know, there's not a crowd. I can just take people to and there's Jesus standing doing his thing. Uh, we can get into church in a minute. But do you know what I mean? It's how do I bring people to Jesus? And there's a clue here where it says they pleaded with Jesus to heal, uh, to lay hands on him and heal him. And And in Christian circles, we talk about this like intercession, prayer and intercession. And that for me is what prayer and intercession is. It's where we stand before Jesus and ask him to do something for someone else who who don't know to ask for themselves to do that. Do you see what I mean? So 
here we are standing before Jesus. We are some people and we are asking him to do stuff for somebody else that doesn't know to ask him to do that because we know he can do it because we've experienced that because we've seen him do that kind of amazing stuff. And that's what intercession is. That's what's prayer. That's what prayer is. So how do we bring people to Jesus? Well, we can do it with prayer. We can do that with intercession, can't we? And that's what bringing to people is all about. And that's the some people in this story. Uh, oh, Sarah just put a comment up here. I like that. Some people equals ordinary people like me and you. Yeah, absolutely. It is definitely ordinary people. I like that as well because I, you know, we're not all kings and queens. Uh, Martin, you don't need to crack my th theology just there. Just, just saying. <laughs> Uh, what Sharon's put here, Sharon's James 4, to you do not have because you do not ask. That's right. That's a great thing, isn't it? We we have to ask. And sometimes people don't know to ask. They don't know how to ask. They don't know how to ask for themselves. So they need people to, to intercede and act on their behalf to ask God to do something, to lay hands on people and to bring that healing. Abby's put here, love it, Matt. Amen and amen. Amen. Okay. So... Notice the crowd for a second here. And this is an interesting thing, isn't it? There's a crowd of people and the Bible draws our attention to the fact there's a crowd of people. Um, and out of that crowd comes some people. And what I find fascinating about this is sort of a great picture of modern day, the modern day world, isn't it? Uh, there are people who would have stayed at home. They would have heard, oh, Jesus is around. I just can't be bothered. I don't want to go and find out. I don't want to go and explore. I don't want to go and see if all of this stuff is real. All I don't want to know if the rumours that I hear are true. I just can't be bothered. I'm happy in my own happy world. I'm going to stay at home. And then there are people which go, you know what? No, I want to go find out. I want to go see if Jesus is all he's cracked up to be, right? I want to know the truth of what's going on here. And so that's the crowd of people. They get out of their house, they hear Jesus around, and they go searching for him. And there are people in that crowd of various different types of sort of um, ideology aren't there there's going to be people there who are hurt and who need healing there are people who are just curious just trying to find out people have never heard of him before and just want to know what's going on there'll be people there that are just there to cause trouble they're like you know what this is all nonsense and this is all blech. and I you know uh, I, I, I don't want to I don't want to be here but I want to I want to talk down everything that you're doing and then there are some people which step out of the crowd and do something a little bit different to bring to Jesus those whom society, let's face it, had written this guy off um, and who was be beyond that kind of help. And so I don't know about you, but I want to be like some people. I don't just want to stand in the crowd. I mean, the crowd for me is a, is a sort of a picture of modern day church. We, we go to church to find out about God, to see God, to experience God. And the crowds would have done that. Um but there has to be more than just being in the crowd. There has to be that element of bringing the hurting and the and the sick and those that need that transformation of Christ into their lives. There has to be that element of it. Does that make sense? So for me, that's some people. OK, so let's move on to the third group, uh, which is the or the third group headed myself here. The second guy. Right. So some people brought him the deaf man with severe speech impediment. Now, this is fascinating for me. Um, this guy obviously needed a miracle, needed some help. Um, he was deaf and he needed a speech and he had a speech impediment. He didn't need one. He had one and he needed to get rid of it. Um, and as far as I know, again, I'm going to stick with this regular guy. As far as I know, this guy was a regular guy. He wasn't a city leader. He wasn't, um, you know, a, a, a businessman necessarily. I don't know who he was. We don't know about him. His background, his history, his education, his uh, his class, his status, none of that makes any difference in the Bible. Um, we just know that this guy stands there before Jesus and Jesus does something quite miraculous uh, in his life, right? But I want you to picture the scene, okay? Um, and again, if it helps, close your eyes. Just think about what's going on and set the scene in your mind, right? We know there's a crowd of people. We know it's a hot day. The sun is going to be strong and relentless, right? You can smell the sand that is moving in the air on the on the light offshore breeze coming in. 
You can hear the noise of the crowd. You can see them. You can probably smell them, right? Uh, you have people just hanging around, watching and waiting. You have people crying out for help, trying to get to the front of the crowd to see Jesus. Um, you've got people shouting obscenities and blasphemy because they don't know any better. Kids are running around not sure how, what to make of the whole thing, right? It's chaos. It's loud. It's bustling. And there's life in it. And at the edge of this crowd... You have the disciples and you have Jesus and they're talking to some people um, and there standing with them is this chap who is deaf and mute. And he's standing there in front of Jesus and he's standing there in front of this whole crowd of people. And the reason why I find this fascinating is because I'm trying to imagine now, right, how this guy is feeling. Does he feel like he's on show? Do you know what I mean? He's, he's sort of this public spectacle for all to see. Does he feel nervous? Is he supposed to act in a certain way? Is he supposed to do something? Is everybody looking at him because he's a freak? Um, maybe this is just one big elaborate joke, you know, that, that people are playing on him. Uh, and he, he doesn't really, he's sort of the last person to know about it. And I guess we've all had those same thoughts, right? We all can stand before Jesus and we can feel exposed. Um, and like the attention of the world is upon us. Um, like we've been set up maybe, and this is all one big hoax, and I'm the last person to know about it. And I wonder if this is the reason that Jesus takes him aside. So let me, uh, where's that? I just need to move. There we go. So it says here, Jesus led him away from the crowd to a private spot. Jesus withdraws him Uh to the private spot, to this private place. And that, let me tell you, that intrigues me no end. What did Jesus say to the crowd to get them to stay where they were as he wanders off with this guy? What did they think when he did that? What was, what was going on in their minds? Did they Were they kind of thinking, this guy is way beyond help and maybe Jesus is taking him aside to let him down gently, do you know what I mean? and just sort of send him on his way? Uh, I don't know. But for me, I think the reason Jesus did it, and I'm, ha I'm kind of happy with this theory, is that he didn't need to put on a show for this guy to get him healed. He didn't need to put on a show for the crowd. And I wonder whether the dignity of the person was more important than the, than the show. Do you know what I mean? Than the extravaganza, than the, the lights, the smoke machines and all that sort of stuff. Was the dignity of that person more important? And don't get me wrong, sometimes Jesus heals in crowds. He heals at big meetings. He heals uh, in those environments. And there's faith there and there's a buildup of faith there and it's great and it's wonderful. But quite often Jesus will take you to a private spot, to a private place. And he can do miracles there too. And and I love that uh, about Jesus. And I love that that he's, he's, he's God in the crowds, but he's God in the private space. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. And again, I look at this and I kind of think, well, the guys, the some people said, no, 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 what, what I want you to do, Jesus, I want you to lay hands on him. And so he gets healed. And. But that's not what happens, is it? And I and I kind of think, well, oftentimes. If I think back on my own life, Jesus doesn't always answer prayer in the way that I'm expecting it. Right. The mechanism, if you like, of Jesus's healing here is he shoves his fingers in the fella's ears and spits on his tongue. Uh, that's that's a little bit different to laying hands on somebody, right? And so, how many times have you seen? How many times have you experienced this? How many times have you experienced it, whereby you've gone to God and you said, "God, I need such and such. I need to be healed." Um, and here's the here's the methodology you can use to do that, right? Which is what some people did. They they went to Jesus and said, "This guy needs healing, so lay your hands on him to do that." So this is what I want, and this is how I want you to do it. Um, so this is the methodology. This is the mechanism of how you will answer my prayer. Um, but Jesus doesn't doesn't answer the prayer in the way that they expect. He doesn't follow their methodology. He doesn't follow their mechanism. Uh, and I think I've got here in my notes that sometimes we have to deal with the fact that the journey to answered prayer is as important as the answer itself. But the journey may not be what we expect. Let me say that again. The journey to answered prayer is as important as the answer itself, but sometimes the journey might not be what we expect, right? Uh, as Matt has just put here, Jesus certainly is unpredictable. 
he is totally right. He's not confined to our box or our methodology or our mechanism. Um, but there's one thing that I do know, that whilst the journey may look different, whilst the mechanism, whilst the methodology looks different for everybody, um, for some folks it may be as straightforward as just Jesus laying his hands on you or you going to church getting someone to lay their hands on you and you get praying, you get, you know, you get healed. For others of us it may be in a private spot, it may be in a secluded spot, it may be up on a mountain where we've taken four days out to be with Jesus. There could be all kinds of things, right? Our journeys are going to look different, but I do know one thing at the end of it, the fundamental thing that Jesus is concerned about is the wholeness of the person stood in front of him. Um, Jesus always brings about wholeness is another way to put it. And I think uh, I think that's super important. What have you put here, babe? Uh, oh, God, there we go. God really answers my prayers in the way I think he will. It generally looks very different in reality, doesn't it? Doesn't it just... I mean, you prayed for a husband and look what he sent you. Very different. Anyway. <laughs> so let me go back to this point. Jesus fundamentally is concerned, I think, about wholeness. Wholeness of your the, of the totality of your being. The, and the journey, the mechanism that he takes you on, uh, the methodology that he uses to get you to that place of wholeness is not predictable. It is not always, uh, you know, safe. So don't lose heart if you've if plan A, plan B, or even plan C is not quite working out how you think it should, um, because it doesn't matter. Jesus is still involved. He still cares, and he's still concerned about your wholeness, and that's his ultimate aim, is the wholeness of you and this world that is before him, right? And so uh, I have no doubt that what Jesus does in your life and what he does in my life is a beautiful thing. It's a miraculous thing. It is a whole thing and we'll be transformed and we will have all these amazing stories uh, like this deaf and mute guy had this amazing story to tell afterwards. Um, but the journey to get there wasn't predictable. And so, uh, which I, it was good news for me. Uh, I Very, very good news. <laughs> yes, she is. Matt, I'm not going to lie. She is, but not as blessed as I am. Okay, so let's carry on with this. So we've got uh, in this the some people. We have got the deaf man with a speech impediment. Um, and I think Jesus saves his dignity and brings about wholeness in such a special and phenomenal and fantastic way. Um, but of course, we've got Jesus. Uh, Jesus is the center of this story. Like I say, Jesus is the center of of every good story and so let's look at uh, what has happened in this let me see if I can bring up the verse here so Jesus leads him away to the private spot sticks his fingers in his ears spits on his tongue gaze into heaven and commands everything to be opened and at once the man's ears were open and he could hear perfectly and his tongue was united and he began to speak normally look at that for me is the very definition of wholeness actively working, right? Um, Christians use this word salvation a lot. I don't know if you've come across this, but we use the word salvation a lot. And salvation um, is, when you get into what it actually means, it's, it's such a big word. It's such an amazing word. It's such a fantastic word. It means nothing missing, nothing broken. It is wholeness personified. I mean, it is just the whole big picture. So not only did Jesus get this guy's ears to ho to open, but at once, and he could hear perfectly, right? But his tongue was untied and he began to speak normally. This guy had never spoke normally his whole life, yet in an instant he speaks normally. And so it's not just, uh, you know, interested in getting the guy's ears open and then saying, there you go, have at it, go figure out how to talk now. No, no, Jesus is all about wholeness. Do you remember the story... Um, in chapter five, where we looked at uh, the woman with the issue of blood. So she'd been bleeding out for 13 years. And she said, if I touch the hem of his garment, talking about Jesus, she spent everything she could with all kinds of doctors, but nothing had worked. She'd grown worse over the years. She was an outcast. There was She was unclean. Nothing was going well for this lady. But in an instant, she touches the hem of his garment. And she says, if I touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. And what's really fascinating in that story is instantly she feels healed. And there's a big difference between healed and wholeness, right? 
And so she feels healed. She feels that healing in her body straight away. But that wasn't wholeness. And so Jesus stops and he goes, oh, hang on a minute. Someone's just touched me. Who touched me? And this woman comes before him trembling and tells him the whole story. And then he says to her this fascinating word, daughter, your faith has made you whole. And I, I just find it fascinating that not only did she get healed, but she wanted to be made whole. And Jesus was concerned about wholeness. And for her, wholeness was being restored back to the family. She'd been an outcast uh from society she thought she was unclean that god didn't care that god didn't love her and in an instant god just demolishes that whole thing by calling her daughter and takes her from healed to whole and that is a beautiful thing let me tell you uh, and that's what jesus does and when he does that we see here that uh where are we here we go they were absolutely besides themselves and astonished beyond measure because that's what Jesus does, right? When you, when you encounter him, when you see him, you become astonished um, beyond measure. I think it's such a great phrase. We become besides ourselves and we become astonished beyond measure because that's just how it works, right? It doesn't matter who you are. I don't know what you've had in life. I don't know what you've not had in life. I don't know what you've missed. I don't know what you've um, missed out on. I don't know what was taken away from you. I don't know what was not given to you or what was given to you. What I do know is that he will astonish you beyond measure because that's Jesus and that's the gospel. When we encounter him, he makes us whole. Not instantly, all the time. Let me get you. There is a process. Definitely. I'm on a journey. <laughs> but he's he cares about wholeness and he's all about taking me on this journey to being whole. Everything he does. Look at what the people say here. Everything he does is wonderful. Everything he does is wonderful. This is a true statement today as it was back then. Um, he still astonishes today. You know, when I was 18, I'm, I moved abroad and lived outside of the UK for a little while. And while I was away, I, I came, fa I had to some friends, in effect, brought me to Jesus. It's the best way to describe it. Some people acted in my life and they brought me to Jesus. And I stood before Jesus, just him and me, in that private spot. And I had to answer um, some, I had to go and find the answer. I had to search out and dig in. Is this true? What's the evidence? Am I just missing out on something? Uh, and when I began to see him and experience him and experience the miraculous touch of Christ, that transforming grace that brings about the change of a person's heart, that deals with the sin, that deals with the bitterness and the anger and the loneliness and the resentment and the anxiety and the fear and the worry and the death and the sickness and all of the evil and contrite things in my heart. When he took them aside and started to transform me, I was absolutely beside myself. Uh, and astonished beyond measure and have been every day since for the last 25 years because this is what Jesus is. He is a transforming God. And you see this in this story, right? And so uh, that, they're the three sort of people groups from the story that I want to draw your attention to. There's some people who do we need to bring before God that cannot speak for themselves, that cannot ask for themselves, that don't know what to ask, that don't know how to behave, that think that they're not quite right for the touch of God. Um, if we're the, the, the deaf guy, um, wh where do we need to stand? Where is Jesus positioning us? Is it in a crowd? Is it in a private spot? What's he saying to us? What's the wholeness that needs to come into our lives? What's that area that he needs to, to transform and to change in our lives? Um, and if you've, if you've never experienced Christ, if you don't know him, if you've never actually encountered him in a way that this guy did in the story, in a way that I did 25 years ago and just about every day since, um, can I encourage you to do so? Can I encourage you to get before God and stand before him? And if you need somebody to take you there, then do get in touch because we'll happily do it. Um, and it can be as simple as, God, just change my life. Um, take my life whatever you whatever you can do with it it's yours and i'm happy that you take it which is what i said 25 years ago i don't know what i've got i don't know what i can give i don't know where we're going to go to all right let's see where it goes and so 
amazing stuff, right? So they all, sorry, I've been, all your comments are coming in now. Oh, we've got Al Marshall on. Excellent. Hey, Al. Great to have you, buddy. One of our fantastic NHS guys. Uh, yay, met Edmonton, found Jesus. Our lives are greatly enriched. Absolutely. I did. Well, maybe he found me. It's probably more important. Um, heal anyone, Lord, who feels incomplete. Heal, reach in love. Amen. So if you're watching this, um, and you need that healing touch. If you need healing, if you need to be made whole, I pray that you will know without, I pray that you will know uh, that touch uh, and that you will feel that touch in Jesus name. OK, so I hope you've got something out of this. Uh, let me. Why does that not come up? Oh, press the wrong button. There we go. So questions. What should take away from this talk? So here you go. You've heard me ramble on for a little while. Um, probably slightly longer than normal. I do apologize for that. Um, but what did you get out? What's God been saying to you during this talk? Share your thoughts in the comments. Um, share them with everybody, what you're thinking. Uh, what's God been saying to you? What have you feel challenged about maybe? Um, what do you feel thankful for? Uh, what? How's God made you whole? Um, just share those things in the comments so people can see because we all get blessed and encouraged by different people's comments, which is fantastic uh be good to see those i'm just getting set up here so i can see the comment feed better so yeah keep 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 your comments coming it's great to have so many people here today great to see you um as i said in a few minutes where i'm going to go through the comments in just one second in a few minutes we are going to head over to zoom so hopefully you are typing your comments as we speak. I always, I know there's always a bit of a delay. Um, we're going to, so in a few minutes time, we're going to head on over to Zoom and carry on conversations over there. We're going to pray um, and catch up with each other. Sharon, my beautiful wife, um, you've seen her pop up on the feed every now and again, uh, is going to be leading that section. Um, in fact, let me, is it still, in, there it is. I'll put the link in the comments below to Zoom so you can join us on Zoom there if you'd like to. It'd be great to see you over there. Um, so, what's Matt put here? Thankful for community, even in isolation and lockdown. Absolutely. Uh, and that's, that's, a, that's another cool thing, isn't it, about what you read in this story. Um, some people bought their friend uh they were a community they looked out for this guy even though he was um even though he's maybe not supposed to be there and uh i kind of think community is such a powerful thing such a lovely thing uh, and so even simple things like al knocking on the door today and catching up just wonderful just lovely um going over to zoom catching up with you would be fantastic love community uh what have you put here babe my takeaway is to take people to jesus whether that's through prayer or conversation or another way. Amen. Absolutely. Do you know one of the things that amazes me? Can I just share this? Of course I can share this. I've got the mic. Who's going to stop me? Uh, unless the power suddenly goes off and it's gone. Um, what fascinates me in all of this, uh, as I was thinking about this, you know, how, how do I, what are the ways I need to bring people to Jesus? I've been doing a few experiments with these Facebook lives. You know, these talks that we do? Um, on the Facebook lives and uh, the best way to reach people. When we do our church plant in Liverpool City Centre, just giving you a few numbers, we have about 20 to 25 people turn up. Um, and it's beautiful and it's fantastic. It's great. And as soon as we can, we are going to get together with everybody and do a meal and have a big hug and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I, I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, but when you guys share you know, on Facebook, like I know Matt did it earlier on. He just shared out the fact that Facebook Live, um, the Facebook Live feed for this to all of his community, to all of Matt's tribe. Um, and I try and do the same, share these things out on Facebook. It's just a simple thing. It takes 10 seconds to share it out on Facebook. Do you know we reach hundreds and sometimes thousands of people with these videos and there's hundreds of engagements with them? It's it's incredible. And like I said at the start, one in four people are now watching a church, church broadcast amazing stuff uh so for me um just coming back to this comment here uh that sharon made whether that's through prayer conversation or another way one of the ways for me is just simply sharing the facebook feed um <laughs> what's my put here? zoom with the head show's happening the head show's not happening but you just need to deal with it 
<laughs> okay, Abby. Uh, I love the part you said about praying and interceding for others, bringing them and their situation before Jesus and asking on their behalf. One of the most powerful and loving things we can do for a friend. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the cool things about this is actually telling them. So we can do it in private, of course. You know, there's a whole bunch of people I'm praying for. But I love to tell people that I'm praying for them um, and that I'm I'm interceding on their behalf because I want to see God do something in their lives. And it is just taking that time to step out, put yourself in an uncomfortable position and ask God to do something uh, would be amazing. Uh, Sharon, sorry, sorry, no head shave on Zoom today, but we'll pray and worship together, followed by general chit chat. <laughs> Thank goodness for that. My boys aren't going to come in and pin me down and shave my head. That's the beautiful thing. Uh, let me tell you so well thank you for your comments guys great to have those I think um, it's been great to sort of share God's word with you so uh, next week we'll be back on Sunday Uh, one of the Langstons I think it's going to be Martin is going to be sharing next week which would be cool Um, so uh, who knows where it will take us with his green screen you're just going to have to come next week to find out. Um, so we've got that to look forward to next week. Just to give you a sort of quick inventory of the week. On Wednesday, we have community. Uh, on Friday nights, we have Alpha. Sunday, we've got the church broadcast. Uh, Al says here, be blessed. You too, my friend. Be blessed. Uh, great to have you. Uh, so that's what's going on. This week, if I don't see you at any other place, I'll see you here next Sunday on Facebook Live. But for those of you who want to join us, um, oh, got more comments coming through. Idea there, might pay money to see that too. Uh, Are you talking about my head being shaved? Because if you are, repent and pay the money anyway for penance. Hopefully, you know, it will sort you out. Um, So... (laughs) So, yeah, so uh, join us on Zoom for some conversation, general chit chat, bit of prayer and worship. It will be great to see you in there. I am now going to stop the Facebook live feed. Thank you so much for being with us. It has been an absolute pleasure. Looking forward to seeing a few of you over in the Zoom room. Anyone's welcome to join us, by the way, even if you've never been before. Come join us. Come say hi. We'd love to see you. Um, I'm going to open that up in about two minutes time. I'm going to get a drink uh, and then I will see you in there. God bless you, each and every one of you. And I will see you at some point during the week in some digital form or another. Have a fantastic week. and May the God of all peace fill you uh, with his amazing love and grace. And may you experience his wholeness this week. Amen.